Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. Last week I mentioned all we have to do really is listen. Hear and obey. Jesus would end his sermons. Let those that have an ear to hear, let them what? Hear what the Spirit says. May you hear what the Holy Spirit tells you. Because if we all listened to the Holy Spirit when he urged us to do something or, or told us, warned us not to do something, the church would be in a much healthier place. We really would. I mean, as a church, I believe our, our light, our presence of that light of the Lord in this world would shine even brighter. Because we would all just be listening to that. What Jesus said, I'll send you the, the Holy Spirit. He will lead you. He'll guide you. He'll, he'll bring to your remembrance all that I've said to you. Isn't it neat how the Holy Spirit can remind us of things about the Lord? And we're thinking, I can't even remember that verse. And all of a sudden you're talking to someone and out, blah, 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 and out came the verse and you're like, where'd that come from? You know, you didn't even know that you remembered it. But the Holy Spirit can bring those things to your remembrance. That's the beauty of the Spirit. That's why Paul said, that's all I wanted you to know was Christ and Him crucified and not, not with fancy words, but with the demonstration of the power, the power of God's Spirit. You need to know that. Now, why did they need to know this? This is what we ended on last time. They needed to know this, he says, because if they didn't, their faith would rest on the wisdom of men, not on the power of God. And a lot of people's faith do rest on just the eloquent words they heard the preacher preach. And it sounds all great until they hit a trial and they need, they need God to rescue them. They need God's power to help them through. And they're trying to grasp for those. What was that preacher? What did he say? What was that fancy? He used some term or what? You know, and, and it doesn't work. It's the power of God that helps you in those, in those times of distress. And that's what he wanted them to know. I want you to know that. So your faith will rest on the power of God. Now, is it good for our faith to rest on the power of God? I mean, how, how safe are we if we're resting on his power? Very safe, right? This is what, this is, by the way, this should be church 101. I mean, like if we had a class on doing church right, we should put this into the curriculum right away. That everybody needs to learn to put their faith resting on the power of God. Because how much will that carry us through in the whole building of our faith? In the whole establishing of a, you know, a solid growth in our life? Would that be a good foundation to put down that we all agree we need to have everything built on His power, not on ours? Because honestly, I think the only time I've seen ministers get in trouble is when they rest on their own power instead of the power of the Lord. And it goes the same for the sheep and the flock. Every time they get into trouble, it's not because they were relying on the Lord. <laughs> Barry's laughing. <laughs> yeah, we know. What were we relying on? <laughs> Ourselves. And that frail, I mean, we think we're so tough and we can handle it. And then, then the, the, the thing really hits the fan, you know? And we're like, this isn't working. Our power runs out. We only have so much power in our own strength. And we can hit trials that that are beyond that power. And this is why we need to know the power of the Spirit of God. How powerful is the Spirit of God? We're going to go into this today. Let's continue now in chapter 2 where we see, Paul says, I didn't want to speak to you with the wisdom of men. But he said, yet, verse 6, we do speak wisdom to you. We speak a wisdom amongst those, he says, that are mature. And a wisdom, however, not of this, of this age or of the rulers of this age. The wisdom that I'm telling you about, this is a godly wisdom. The wisdom of this world is passing away, he says. But we speak God's wisdom in a mystery, in a hidden, the hidden wisdom, he says, which God, God predestined before the ages to, the, to our glory. God has wisdom that, the, well, look at what Paul goes on to say. He says, the wisdom which, verse 8, none of the rulers of this age has understood. If they had understood it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. If they understood God's wisdom, they would not have killed the Messiah. 
But Paul then quotes Isaiah. By the way, this next, you, you might notice verse 9 in your Bible is written maybe in a different type or font or italics. That's the translator's way of telling you it's a quote from somewhere else in the scripture. And here it says, just as it was written, the things which eye has not seen, ear has not heard, the things which have not entered into the heart of man that God has prepared for those who love him. The very thing, how, how great are the things that God has prepared for us that love him? Is he, we can't even imagine. In fact, if, you, if you're familiar with this passage that he's quoting from here in Isaiah, this is Isaiah 64, by the way, near the end of the book of Isaiah. Now, Isaiah, Isaiah was a man who prophesied during one of the greatest kings in the ancient days of Israel. His name was Hezekiah. Very upright king. He abolished all of the, the evil practices as a nation. The, the offering of, of um, well, actually they offered, because it's hyenas, the stuff they did. They would offer to Molech and Balaam, these false gods, um, their babies, on a, burn them in the, in the glowing hot arms of their idols. And he abolished all of that. He said, there's only one God, Jehovah. We'll serve him. Hezekiah did. His, his, um, he called Isaiah the prophet. Hezekiah the king called Isaiah his friend. Now this king, Hezekiah, is a wonderful man when you read about him. Just love God, said we need, to re we, we need national reform. We need to get rid of this evil practices, killing these babies like this, and serve the Lord. And because of him, Israel was greatly prospered. In the days of Hezekiah, they had, they had enemies come against them and the Lord fought the, I mean, great, I mean, mighty things the Lord did to fight against the enemies. 185,000 men die in one night, by the, not by the hand of Hezekiah. Does anyone know who took out all those guys, of the Syrians? One angel. God sent one angel. I'll take care of you guys. Don't worry about that. I love that story. I'm like, man, but see, that happened because that man... It says was upright, Hezekiah. Now, unfortunately, there's a story that comes about where he has, um, Hezekiah is told by Isaiah, get your house in order. You're going you're gonna to die. The Lord's call, it's your time to go home. And he's like, what did I do wrong? I've served the Lord, you know. I mean, I've, I've been a good guy and upright. And for those of you that haven't read this story in Second Kings, it's um, found in chapter 20. He, he cries out to the Lord and, and, and you know, look, I remember I, your servant was upright and I did these good things. And the Lord says, all right, tell Isaiah to go back in and tell him, I'll, give you, I'll grant you 15 more years. Now, this is one of the studies that I have to tell you, it, it, it has a little bit of a stinger. Because this is men trying to get their way versus God's way. And the only reason I say this is because if you read, the, read carefully what happens into the next chapter, you find out in that next 15 years what he lives, he winds up with a son. Three years into the 15, he has a boy. His name is Manasseh. When the Lord does take Hezekiah home, Manasseh is now 12 years old, and he takes over as king. He reigns for 55 years, by the way, over Israel, and he is considered one of Israel's most wickedest kings ever. And the, the, the real, I mean, think about this. Okay, just for you moms here, if you look at chapter 21, it tells us the name of the mom, the wife of Hezekiah. Her, her name is Hephzibah. It, it's a, Hephzibah is, um, is the, the do, my delight. It's, it's like affectionate term. My delight, and, and Ba is her. She, like, she is my delight, is kind of how it comes. Across. It's backwards to English, but it's like, my delight, she is. <laughs> that, that's how it translates literally, but is a beautiful name. This woman, Hezekiah, the guy that, that the Lord is, and, and by the way, if you don't know, Hez, does anyone know what Hezekiah means, translates? Okay, well. In, in Hebrew, Yah is for a contraction for Yahweh. It's Hezekiah in Hebrew. So Hezekiah is my strength, and Yah is the Lord, or Yahweh, or Yehovah is another translation of the, 
of the name of the Lord. So it literally is, the Lord is my strength. If you're looking for baby names, Hezekiah is a good one. The Lord is my strength. So, so Hezekiah, the Lord is my strength, is married to, to my delight is in her. And he asks for 15 more years and he gets Manasseh. Crumbhead. No, um... <laughs> Manasseh, the most wicked kid who will reign for 55 years and basically wind up having, I mean, literally a pig sacrificed on the altar in the temple. He will take Israel down the drain spiritually. And the part that kills me is in chapter 21, I know that Hezekiah winds up departing this earth because it says his son took over at 12 years old. And that was the, you know... 15 years are up that, that he had asked for the extension of his life. But it doesn't say mom died. My delight in her is still in the chapter, in chapter 21. So how would you like as moms to be married to the most upright king? The whole nation's history, you got the best one. And then you have a son who turns out to be what? The worst one. The worst one of the lot. And but by the way, there is no guarantees, guys. We can serve the Lord with all our heart and doesn't make our children do it. Now, if they do, we rejoice. But it's not a given. In fact, if you read the book of Kings, you find out it's like a pattern. There's a good king, then there's a bad king. Then a good king, good king, bad king. Bad king, good king, bad king. It, there's no guarantee that just because you're a good dad, your kids will wind up serving the Lord. And this was the case indeed. And in the book of Isaiah, chapter 64, where, where Isaiah... You guys probably know this chapter. It's one of the most quoted chapters. How many of you guys know the, 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 the verse that the Lord is the potter and we are the what? The clay. You know that one? That's Isaiah 64. How many of you guys know the verse that says, Our righteousness is as filthy rags. Literally, the menstruation rags is what it, it translates from. It's literally, our righteousness is nothing. It's the Lord that is righteous. You heard that one? Just a few verses before, the potter and the clay verse. Same chapter, Isaiah 64. Now, the verse what Paul quoted. Now, Paul could have dazzled them with all this stuff. He could have, you know, put it in the context of... But see, Paul, if you read the end of chapter 64, he says, we have sinned as a nation. We have turned from you. And if you know Isaiah, you know the span of the time what he, he was used to prophesy. You know, this couldn't have been the early days in his ministry, when he wrote chapter 60. This is later, when Manasseh has taken over, because he says that they, that some very uh, specific things that they were doing as evils that had come back into the nation. And he, and he says, God, we, we, we're, we're crumbs, man. We, we're filthy before you. But Lord, be strong for us, not because of us, but because of what? Because of who you are. And there's no one, there's no one can even understand. Look at verse 4 of Isaiah 64. He says, For for the from the days of old they have not heard nor perceived by their ear, nor has the eye seen a God beside you who acts in behalf of the one who waits for him. There is no God like you that can act on our behalf. The things what you have done, he says, there's none like you. The eye hasn't even seen. The ear has. We can't even fathom. Now, I don't think this is a coincidence that Paul quotes this verse to this church at Corinth, this young church that is just really dealing with a lot of carnality around them. They've got all the sinful stuff going around in their culture. And he's saying, guys, you need to, you need to have your faith established on the power of God. And let me quote you a verse that comes from this idea that there is nothing, nothing that God cannot do for those that wait on him. Your eye can't even see, your ear can't even, I mean, you can't even fathom how great God is at his job. Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, go to our website, AmazingGraceKona.com and click the link to follow us on Facebook. That's AmazingGraceKona.com Mahalo and God bless.